Coming from the prairies, a pair of artists will grow to become two of the country's most beloved musical icons. Joni Mitchell and Neil Young write timeless songs that reflect the beauty of Canada's natural landscape. They'll move on to become influential players, and although they will both move south to pursue their careers, they are forever quintessential Canadian artists. I met Neil, like, not formally. He had a band called The Squires, and as Neil got better and better, and we got better and better, and started to make records, first at our radio stations, then at real recording studios, we'd play each other our latest records. The Squires became four to go, essentially, and it was Neil's band from, from Winnipeg. In 1964, at age 16, Rick James joined the Naval Reserves to avoid the draft, but he says he wasn't cut out for military life. After a year of service, Rick went AWOL. I went to Canada and stayed there for AWOL from the Navy for about two and a half years, which is, was great because that's when my musical career really got underway. After fleeing to Canada in 1965, Rick started a band called the Minor Birds. It included future members of the group Steppenwolf and an up-and-coming singer-songwriter named Neil Young. Music is really colorblind. Rick and Neil headed to Detroit to make it big. The band signed a record deal with Motown and recorded several songs, including the Minor Bird Hop. This rare recording is the only evidence of this once promising band. Just as they were about to release their first single, Rick and Neil fired their manager. In retaliation, he informed Motown that Rick was wanted by the military. I remember me and Neil in our apartment, and we were sitting down that, that night. Motown stopped the deal because they knew I was AWOL. After their manager blew the whistle, Motown shelved the project. It was a devastating time for Rick and Neil. Well, Neil, Neil became quite restless because he wasn't performing enough. One day he left. He sensibly and wisely got in the hearse and made tracks for the West Coast. It was one of the great performances, because we think of that as one of our fondest memories that night. I want to live, I want to give, I've been a miner for a heart of gold, it's these expressions I never give that keep me searching for Searching for a heart of gold And I'm getting old I think back then he was like any rock star, you know, just somebody you looked up to. Now we look to him as a guidepost, you know, somebody who you could shape your whole career around it and or somebody who you could look to and say, you know, we can, in 10 years, we can still be doing this, you know? It was like, I mean, look at Neil, he does whatever he wants to do. When we were trying to figure out what songs we were gonna do with all the, the different artists of the last waltz, and, and Neil suggested, you know, why don't we do Four Strong Winds? It was so nice, because it was so out of respect for Ian as a songwriter, and, and so he said, oh no, we'll do Four Strong Winds, and then we'll do the other Canadian song. We'll do Helpless. Helpless, help. One of our big idols for everybody in Toronto was, was, uh, was uh, Ronnie Hawkins and the Hawks. Th that Toronto sound, and especially the Ronnie Hawkins and the Hawks sound, became a very important part of how the music developed and how a lot of musicians developed. When I first joined Ronnie Hawkins, he wanted to surround himself and took great pride in having like a crackerjack, you know, group of of musicians playing with him. The early Canadian version, the version that became the band, the bar was so high and the chemistry between the players, they really were as good as anybody you could ever hear. And I do think that they really had a huge influence on the other local artists. You know, they set a very, very high standard. And Robbie and the rest of the band, you know, Lee Vaughn and Richard and Rick and, and Garth, you know, they were just really cool. One of the first things I think of when I think of the band is just musicianship and guys who are really into musicianship and being players. All of a sudden, we're on our own. We had to rehearse more. We had to keep the standards up, the private practice even. You know, it was 
It was a great time musically for us. The band's songwriting is, is a real a study in characterization and giving life to characters in a song. Some of the band's songs are just songs that are there as part of the fabric of not just Canadian life, but just life in general. They're part of the rock and roll fabric. I mean, what can you say about the band? I mean, they're the band. I joined the band in 66, and that summer we decided to tour Saskatchewan. And we saw an incredible thing. A girl right out of high school, Joni Mitchell, and she played these incredible songs she had just written. And I remember being so impressed, not, not only by her, her music, which was unique and original. And that's what I liked. I've always liked original. I mean, if you're going to write a song like every other song, why bother? But she had an originality about her, and she also, the way she carried herself, she was very, very beautiful. unrecognized guitar players in Canada for sure. She's one of my favorite guitar players. And her jazz sense and all that stuff. I mean, what a sophisticated player. I mean, she's really something. I loved her music and I had a tape. I guess she gave me a tape. Man, I carried that thing around. I can't tell you how long. And I remember playing it for different managers and hot shots on the business side of uh, the music industry. And Buffy, who I, I was managing then, said, there's a girl named Joni Mitchell playing in town tonight, Elliot. You have got to see her and hear her songs. I literally quit my job and went on the road the next morning, literally the next morning. So I was obviously incredibly moved. I met a redneck on a Grecian Isle who did the goat dance very well. He gave me back my smile, but he kept my camera to sell. Oh, the rogue, the red, red rogue. He cooked good omelets and stews And I might have stayed on with him there But my heart cried out for you California Oh, California I'm coming home Oh, make me feel good rock and roll band I'm your biggest fan California, I'm coming home You're walking and the streets are full of strangers All the news are home You read, just give you the blues She was writing incredibly deep lyrical songs that to told stories and wove images and pictures in your head. It's just sort of transporting the people into another world. She takes a lot of specifics, but makes those specifics seem magical. She opened my eyes to music and, in, in specific, songwriting. I remember when I first found Blue and heard Case of You, I played it over and over and over and over and over again. I drew a map of Canada, oh, Canada. Your face sketched on it twice. Oh, you're in my blood like holy wine. It tastes so bitter and it tastes so sweet. Oh, I could drink a case of you. I think that was the first time I'd heard the word Canada 
in a piece of music. And um, like, I drew a map of Canada. And the way she sang it, it just was like, oh yeah. And it, it was so her story. Everybody who listens to it says the same thing. That's my life, or that, that's about me, or that touches, that speaks directly to me. In my deepest, darkest, most depressed moments, that record, from time to time, has been the one that I play. If I had to pick one album to listen to over and over and over again, it would probably be Blue, which I think is one of the five best albums ever made. And still be on my feet, I'd still be on my feet. <laughs>